Trust me, this isn't sour grapes, but the fact that Dwayne is in the main event of WrestleMania next year and I'm not makes me sick. Like the video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on those notifications. And once you're done, leave a comment down below and I just might end up responding. Conspiracy theories, rumors, speculation, professional wrestling fans seem to be even more drawn to the like than typical fan bases, and in all honesty, it does make a hint of sense. Unlike regular TV watchers, a very large chunk of WWE's fans are in on kayfabe's inner workings, and therefore have some kind of right to feel a bit more knowledgeable than they should about the product that they're watching. So when something out of the ordinary happens, it's almost natural for our brains to come up with a theory as to what's going on and just leave it up as truth. We already know too much, so why wouldn't we be able to know more. At least that makes sense to me. Maybe I'm just a fucking idiot who should have paid attention in psychology. Either way, I'm D. Wick and these are 10 WWE conspiracy theories that many fans take as the truth. Now, immediate disclaimer, these are all theories, not proven, not true, and some of them are a bit ridiculous. That's kind of the point of conspiracy theories. I'm merely the messenger, so before you leave your comments I'm a fucking idiot, I already know that, but this isn't why. Anyways, number 10, Daniel Bryan was always medically cleared. It is with a heavy heart and the utmost sadness that I officially announced my retirement. Oh, 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 let's start with the one that, if true, is goddamn infuriating. Daniel Bryan has obviously had a rough career in terms of injuries. The dude treats his head like it's disposable and has had more concussions in one career than most people will have injuries throughout their entire lifetime. The story goes that while, yes, Daniel Bryan's latest concussion back in 2015 was serious, it wasn't nearly serious enough to put the man in retirement. Instead, WWE purposefully had their doctors not clear Brian since he saw him as a roadblock in the way of the man they wanted to push at the time, Roman Reigns. It does make some sense. I wouldn't put it past WWE to pull something like this, and every single other doctor Brian went to did clear him. And you all know how much they wanted to push Reigns. Well, who was the most popular babyface through pretty much the entire early stages of the Roman Reigns experiment? Oh my god, it adds up. You are cleared. Number nine, Brock Lesnar wasn't supposed to end the streak. A third and five to the Undertaker. Oh. Brock Lesnar into the cover, hooks the leg. The streak is over. Now this one's a bit more wild. There's a few different variations and completely different stories, but the most interesting one to me is that Brock Lesnar called an audible during the match and took the spot as the man who broke the streak unplanned. The original plan was for Lesnar to conquer Taker, but Undertaker was against the idea. Everyone knows he wanted to give back to the business and use his legendary streak to help put over a fresher, younger talent. Someone like a Bray Wyatt who he supposedly wanted to work with the entire time. Taker already had his limelight, so he didn't need this wave of momentum, especially seeing as he just came back from UFC. It's WWE's fault they were booking him well. He shouldn't have to lose his streak for that. Give it to someone better. Well, Taker got his request and he was set to go over, but thanks to a concussion during the match, which actually did happen, Lesnar saw this, noticed Taker was unable to finish the match the way they had in mind, and took control and decided that pinning the man was both safer to The Undertaker and better in terms of his career, making that legendary Paul Heyman reaction authentic. Number eight, Vince McMahon truly hates minorities. If that's not the greatest entry title I've ever written, I don't know what is. And by extension, um, not only does he hate minorities, both WCW and indie wrestlers as well, specifically them, because to him, a minority is anyone below him, and anything that isn't WWE is below him. WWE's past definitely does have hints of racism to it, and until Triple H put a strong role behind the scenes, indie wrestlers didn't really exist in WWE besides a punk or a goat face here and there. It definitely is a bit curious that there's never been a fully black world champion before, especially in today's uber equality landscape, as well as the fact that it took breaking into India for the first man of color in years to become world champion. I'm just saying, maybe WrestleMania 35 is going to be main evented by the women, but how much of that is really because because of Vince. This man, Kofi Kingston, has been here for 11 years. This man deserves better. This man deserves more. Number seven, the ultimate warrior was replaced. This ridiculous rumor is absolutely false. This one's kind of wonky, but it's fun, so let's roll with it. Legend goes that somewhere during the early stages of the ultimate warrior's career, post WrestleMania 6, the man behind the mast was murdered. 
That part of the theory branches into some wild directions. Some people say Hulk Hogan literally put a hit out on him. Some say Vince McMahon put a hit out on him. That's crazy, but if you're taking this theory as truth, I think we could just we could just chill with the man dying, all right? We don't have to fucking murder him in this fantasy life to you, okay? Anyways, he's dead. Ultimate Warrior is dead. And the man we once knew was the Renegade, who was a literal knockoff warrior, took his place and lived the full life of the Ultimate Warrior, all the way until his death in 2014, which some people have also theorized on because of how coincidental his death was right after that Hall of Fame speech where he talked about, like, the circle of life. But again, I don't think anyone put a hit out on him either time. <laughs> I think he could just die, okay? Theories don't need theory layers, all right? Th th just leave it as a theory. There will always be only one warrior, and he headlined the Hall of Fame class of 2014. Number six, the Montreal screw job. I look at it from the standpoint of the referee did not screw Bret Hart. Shawn Michaels certainly did not screw Bret Hart. Nor did Vince McMahon screw Bret Hart. Well, I take that back. I guess theories can have theories sometimes. There are so many damn layers to this event, and it'll pretty much never be proven what actually happened. The story that we have right now, the one that is the most accurate, as far as we can tell, seems to be that Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels hated each other in real life, behind the scenes. Uh, Bret refused to drop his WWF championship in his hometown of Montreal to Shawn, but Vince McMahon came out and screwed Bret out of the title by forcing the bell to be rung while Shawn Sean had Brett in his own submission, the sharpshooter, but some theorists have concocted a storyline where all of this was a complete work seeing as the moment forcefully outed McMahon as the owner of WWF, birthed the evil Mr. McMahon character, and launched the company into its most successful period. However, seeing as we have eyewitnesses that Brett literally punched Vince out backstage when no cameras were rolling, it does seem kind of unlikely, however, they could have also been in the story. We don't know. Vince McMahon has a lot of power. Dude holds a lot of weight. He could have had the whole company in on a secret like this. So, will we ever know what happened? No. Is this one likely? Probably not. I truly believe that Bret Hart screwed Bret Hart. And he can look in the mirror and know that. And speaking of ones that are unlikely, number five, Finn Balor's injury was a ruse. Another one that would really piss me off to all hell. Some people find it a bit convenient that Vince McMahon, a dude who really doesn't treat those NXT call-ups as main roster equals, again, going back to his minority complex, allowed Finn Balor to come up to the main roster as Raw's third overall draft pick, mind you, pin Roman Reigns clean, and win the Universal Championship at SummerSlam, before suddenly being taken out of action with an injury. Yeah, some people have theorized that Vince pulled Bauer aside at some point and made a deal with him, allowing Triple H's wish of NXT call-ups finally being valuable without needing to actually use them significantly and then taking them off television, only to come back and never reach the same heights because now Vince has one up on Triple H because his guy couldn't hang. I don't think this one's true, but I swear to God, if I ever found evidence, I'm burning WWE to the ground. That's legally a threat, so we're gonna pretend I didn't say that. Never mind, WWE, the only flames I'm giving you are through these videos. Number four, celebrity GMs were a bet gone wrong. I randomly came across this one not too long ago online, and part of me really hopes this one is true, because it, there finally will be some sort of actual explanation as to why there's so many goddamn celebrity general managers from 2009 to 2010. The story goes that the illustrious and very terrible celebrity GM hosting area of WWE was brought about through a bet with Seth Green. That's right, while Batista and Ted DiBiase Sr. had hosted the two previous weeks, Seth Green showed interest and became the first ever celebrity host of that era, the first of an unfortunate many, which apparently was because of a drunken bet Seth Green made after the show with Vince. No one's really sure what the bet could have been, but rumor has it Vince lost and Seth Green got to pick the next celebrity who would who would be the like the host, and then they got to pick the next one and it just kept going for like a year. That's ridiculous, and in all honesty, this one probably didn't happen, but it's interesting to think about how the fuck this dog shit year of hosting could have began. Make a fist and throw oh, it right to the face of Tony Rhodes! I can't believe it, and neither can Seth Green! Number three, the pipe bomb. Before I leave in three weeks with your WWE Championship, I have 
a lot of things I want to get off my chest. The pipe bomb and the Montreal Screwjob are probably the two most infamous moments of kayfabe blending itself into reality, and just like the Screwjob, there are theories all over the place about the pipe bomb. Given the fact that it was surrounded by CM Punk, a well-known outspoken man who never had an issue giving his opinions WWE wished so strongly that he'd keep to himself, it's not crazy to think what many people now consider a work shoot was actually just Punk going off on a real tangent. Trust me, this isn't sour grapes, but the fact that Dwayne is in the main event of WrestleMania next year and I'm not makes me sick. Number two, Stephanie me Steph, what was that? Number two, Stephanie McMahon and Randy Savage. The long-standing rumor with this one is that Stephanie had a behind-the-scenes relationship with the macho man that became sexual, and the real reason why Randy Savage was forced out of the company. The timeline of this relationship and him leaving for WCW match up kind of perfectly, so it does make some sense. Maybe the real reason the macho man had to leave was because he was being a little bit too macho around little old Steph, who was 18 at the time, by the way. That's... That's some big yikes territory. This is also around the time Savage's relationship with Miss Elizabeth was hitting an all-time low and ending, so honestly, it makes a lot of sense how this conspiracy theory has kept itself alive for so long. Randy Savage has been unable to sign a, a contract with the World Wrestling Federation, not unable to uh, rather come to terms with the World Wrestling Federation for a new contract. And number one, Vince Russo was a Vince McMahon pawn. My absolute favorite WWE conspiracy theory. This one's fucking genius. If it's not true, Shame on Vince, he should have done this. We all know Vince Russo and his batshit crazy ways behind the scenes. He's responsible for admittedly some great action-packed television, that's fair, but he's also responsible for some of the stupidest, absolute mind-boggling worst decisions in the history of professional wrestling. Look no further than the phrase, Judy Bagwell on a forklift match for proof. I don't know how it gets worse than those seven lore. God damn it. I don't know how it gets worse than those six words in a row. Come on! Do math! Well, the theory goes that Russo wasn't actually insane, and instead was just a pawn in Vince McMahon's long-term plan. They agreed that before Russo left the WWF, he would get to do some weird shit, make sure everyone in WWE and WCW and both audiences alike know about Vince Russo, know that his booking is insane, and then send him over to WCW, who McMahon was cool with getting ahead of them in the race as Vince Russo was the master plan nuke all along, and it was all thanks to a plan concocted by the pair of Vince's, Russo would take over as the head of creative during the worst period in WCW history and book it to an oblivion point where they just could not compete with the WWF anymore, giving McMahon the victory. Wow. Well, the fans in Richmond love it. These people gotta learn to shut up and show respect. And those are nine WWE conspiracy theories the fans believe, and one that I am desperate to somehow prove. Uh, what are your thoughts? Let us know in the comments down below after liking the video, subscribing to the channel, and notifications, and that bell. Thanks for watching, guys.